Um, Hello there, everybody, and welcome to Assassin. I am Neil. I will be your DM, and this is Rob. He will be your player. Uh, Rob, how are you doing? I'm doing excellent. I think we can promise everyone an incredibly dynamic show. Both people involved, first names are action verbs, so you can't get more action-packed than that. Absolutely not. What other show can make that claim? What other show can make that claim? <laughs> um... Wow. So uh, for those of you that don't know, Rob and I have been playing D&D for a long time, both together and, and separately as individuals. I've been playing for since like the late 90s. So what is that? That's about 20 years now. Uh, Rob, you've been playing a little bit longer than me, I believe. Yes. Oh, late 90s, you child of summer. <laughs> These were my first D&D books. 1981. Are those the original ones that you had in 1981, or are these replacements for the ones that have been worn down? Those are the books from 1981. So, wow. OG D&D player. To the max. That's Absolutely. right. Rolling dirty. <laughs> um, I'm rolling. They hating. Yeah. So, uh, what have you been up to in the last week or so? I hear you might be working on a new Twitter handle. Yes, you asked me about a Twitter handle, and first I was like, what do I need that for? And I thought, you know, maybe, maybe I should get one. Yeah, just something, something simple says who I am and maybe what I'm about. I'm going to become, as you know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, studying to become a therapist, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I thought right there, just Rob Therapist, you know, just Rob and I, I was thinking that there's no way just a nice simple twitter handle like that could ever come back to my certainly never you know get me arrested or anything just rob therapist. you know that's a good idea but why don't you sleep on it for a week and um we'll, we'll come back to it and maybe maybe we'll come up with something a little bit better uh not better because that's not bad but something um, more wonderful next week. I don't know. I was thinking, you know, maybe I'd run that by, you know, I have a friend who's a police officer and, you know, he's generally, you know, he works PR at the police office. And I figure he's got a case for these things. Yeah. A therapist. See what he thinks. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, um, so we'll have a new player for you guys next week, but for this week, uh, we'll have Rob here. Um, let's talk a little bit about what Assassin is. Assassin is a single player campaign, as you can clearly tell, and it involves murder. Uh, no, no ifs, ands, ors, or buts about it. Our job here is to kill people, people that probably deserve to be killed, maybe not, but it's all for the, the greater world order. This is a homebrewed campaign. It takes place in Arcadia, which is my world setting. And our assassin here will be working for Malchus, the god of chaos, whose philosophy is that, um, you know, when things are rough and chaotic and turbulent, that's when the strongest people rise to the top. And so if you want to make the world a better place, you got to stir the pot and you got to mix it up and you got to let chaos reign supreme. And then naturally, the, the very best will rise to the top. And so we're here to destabilize a world that is going very, very well, uh, too well. And uh, so we're here to kill some people. Yeah. And I just want to say, because the thing that I'm known for on some other show is making completely broken characters that 
basically, Neil broke my ankles and really <laughs> limited what I could do here. So yes. if you're looking at my character and you're thinking, Rob could have done so much better. I absolutely agree. <laughs> Every time I did, Neil said, oh, no, you can't do that either. We're adding mm -hmm. that to the restrictions. No, no, no. You can't take that feat. No, no, no. The background's not acceptable. Mm, no, I can't use those stats. Yeah, I, I've definitely hobbled him. If you've seen Rob and I play before, you'll know that with the the very slightest character, he will very quickly uh, overpower your campaign and derail it and break it. And it's wonderful and fun, but I figured for a game like this, we needed to, to push Rob to his limits. So uh, we've given him a character that is workable, but has a lot of growth potential is what we're calling it. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, okay. Um, well, we're gonna just kind of hop into game here. You are going to be sitting in a tea house just outside of the town of Confluence because your watcher is the term, uh, kind of your handler here with the organization, uh, is meeting you here for, uh, for your very, very first job. You've uh, never killed anyone for the organization, roughly sort of known as the architects. And uh, this is going to be your first time. Is there anything we should know about your character before we hop into game? Well, I would be sitting there, a picture. He wouldn't be dressed quite as uh, the wonderful character art. Awesome. Just be dressed fairly inconspicuously in this case. Just as a traveling bard, he drumming a little bit on his wearing a multicolored jacket with uh, strips of cloth tied to a bit of ribbon. And sitting beside him is his cat. Pops drumming his down. And what is your cat's name? Sophie. Sophie. This is not the first Sophie that you've had, is it? I feel like I've seen you with a cat named Sophie before. I don't remember no? what other cat was. I think this is Sophie, although not my first cat. Okay. Other people remember it. Elven cat. Right, right. That's a different one. Um, let me see. It's not an OP cat stronger than the entire party. This is just a normal cat making it fairly stronger than a wizard. Right, right. This is, yeah. Uh, I think your mic was a little bit low, but I've boosted your volume and will be good from here, I hope. Uh, so you are sitting in a little tea shop just south of Confluence, uh, waiting for Ripley to show up, waiting for your, your watcher to show up. And uh, sure enough, after maybe a half hour of sitting down at this lovely and quite quiet tea shop that doesn't have very many patrons, uh, a, a courier sits down next to you. Uh, you recognize her face to be Ripley, your watcher. She's about 5'4", uh, 136 pounds. She's a human female in her 40s somewhere with medium length wavy brown hair, some soft freckles, deep set brown eyes and um, speaks to you with a, a soft, straight, and even tone. <clears throat> and she starts off by saying, not, not looking at you, of course, but just sitting next to you and looking off into the distance. <clears throat> Are you ready for your first mission? It's simple and open, meaning she doesn't know you're coming and the manner of her death is of no importance to us. What that mean? Well, it may not sound too bad, and she may not know that you're coming for her, but she's armed and dangerous. You be careful. Is this fucking dead? She's your predecessor. Her name is Sarah Wilkins. See, not that she... She flubbed a job. A watchman on the docks of High Castle. 
He needed to disappear overnight without raising any questions or alarms and had no idea that he was marked for death. Simple and secret. She knocked him off the dock into the water late at night. It would have been perfect. There are people drown there all the time, especially in the canals. Except this guy was a strong swimmer and Wilkins missed it when she was assessing him. She got away, but our smuggler didn't. I told her to come here to Confluence and hide low for a little while. Seems the point of her life was to be an object lesson to others. Where can I find her? How will I know? She's 5'3", 127 pounds, short, straight, black hair, with uh, bells on a string tattooed around her left ankle. She's been spending most of her time at the Forester here in Confluence. It's a, a tavern near the entrance of town and is armed with a hidden weapon, an enchanted stiletto known as Kiss. It was made at the beginning of this last stage during the times of troubles and chaos. Those were good days. Uh, the point is impossibly sharp and never dulls. This blade has served our cause well for many generations being passed from agent to agent until it fell into her hands, and soon into yours. Where does she hide this way? Ripley shakes her head. I don't know. Somewhere on her at all times, though. And one last thing. For this project, you're going to be on your own. Normally, I would be here to provide you with material support or aid if you need it, but Wilkins knows my face. And on top of that, you need to prove yourself. You've got about two weeks before she gets suspicious. Chaos calls the week. Gives rise to the great. She gives you a brief nod, uh, stands up, pays for her tea, and walks away. Leaving you just outside of the town of Confluence. And this here, everybody, is the town of Confluence. Uh, we are going to be off the map a little bit, just uh, maybe a mile out of town or so. All right, are we still in the tea house or are we uh, teleporting? Yes. No, we are still in the tea house. Um, and if you, you now Ripley's leaving shortly. So if you want to talk to her, you can, but she's about to back off. All right, no, that, that's that's fine. I um, After she leaves, I... At Sophie, it and I pull out, um, hanging around my neck, a small pouch. I pour out the contents, twelve copper coins. Pick up one, twirl it around on my finger a little bit, looking at. It. And I say. Leonardo. And then I put them all away. And put the, the one that I've been twirling around away last of all. Can you tell us um, a little bit about Sophie while you're playing with your coins and naming them, perhaps? Um, what type of... Is Sophie like a Bond villain cat? Like the big white fur and the angry face? Or is it more of a Dr. Evil cat with absolutely no fur? No, she's she's a fairly standard cat. Not, a, nothing that you would take a second look at. Uh, black with some white on her. Just nothing sinister, not particularly spoiled or anything. She's just a little fluffier than most, but that's about it. A <laughs> little fluffier a, than most. Okay. A, a, or fairly ordinary looking cat that would not arise arouse any suspicion at all. Sure. Sure, and we'll probably survive the whole campaign. <laughs> uh, okay, well, welcome to Confluence. This is, it might be your first time here. I don't know. Um, you might've passed through it before, or this might be your very first time entering the town. Um, but here you are, you're at the, the base of the town, uh, ready to walk in as you please. You know the t Forester, the tavern is right here where I'm pinging. Um, and yeah, I think that's everything that we need to know for now. 
All right. So first off is not to go to Forrester. No. First off, I am going to go in. I've got my instruments. I've got a bundle, something or some things long on my back wrapped up in my um, my bedroll and bound with leather strips. Mm -hmm. And I walk into the center of town. I'll have my lute out playing a bit here and there. Um, I'll have Sophie perched up on my shoulder, riding along. She's used to that. And I'm just getting the lay of the land here. In particular, I'm looking at other taverns, and I'm looking for maybe some of the seedier taverns or any signs that I might recognize that would indicate um, you know, thieves' guild involvement. Mm, you're looking for those those dirty underworld elements. Yes, the the amateurs. <laughs> All right. Well, let's walk you into town. Can you make me? Uh, I want it to be a charisma check. I don't know if there might be a substat that will work for five E for this. Let's see. Um. Yeah, why don't you make me an investigation check as you walk around town um, and you're kind of looking about for those criminal elements. Yeah. So as you, you make your way through the, the main street and into the, the town square there, everything looks to be on the up and up. Um, you don't see any scoundrels hiding in the shadows. You, there's no deals going down off on the side. The, the people that are about look to be uh, fairly well-spoken and honest individuals, uh, except for the farmers, they're definitely not well-spoken, but they look pretty honest. Um, this looks to be a wonderful place filled with happy, law-abiding citizens who are continuing to prop, uh, not propagate, to, to push the already established corrupt world along. The Thieves Guild may be a little less amateur than I thought. Hmm. Okay. Um, so here you are in the Market Square. What's your plan? Again, getting the lay of the land. Um, hmm, it would be good to start getting a sense of where I might purchase some allies. So that actually brings up, what do I have in terms of resources monetarily? Ooh, I should have told you that. You have 14 days to complete your mission. You have 3,000 copper for uh, your resources to start it off. Uh, Wilkin, not Wilkins, um, uh, Ripley would have handed you a bag of mixed gold, silver, and copper that totals about 3,000 in copper, uh, or 30 gold for those of you that are still on the gold standard, which is a little outdated. Um, yeah. That's what you got. Well, I, I am glad that you are making gold standard references rather than trying to make the new audience do math. I, but, I'll hold their hand, but I will bring them kicking and screaming to the true copper standard that all D&D should be played in. Yeah. Anyway, it's, it's the future. I swear. Just trust me, in five years, everyone will be using the copper standard because it makes way more sense than the gold standard. I will defend it till my dying breath. All right, I'm <laughs> going to look around for inns. Uh, for and I think the first day, I'm going to go from inn to inn. I'll spend a few coppers on uh, on beer. I'm trying to get a sense, both professionally, what what are places that I might be able to make some coin playing. Mm -hmm. But I'll say spend an hour at each inn, and I'm listening for the sound of thieves' cant to see if anyone, if anywhere, I hear phrases being worked into conversations that I, that I recognize as carrying more meaning. 
Sure. Um, the two inns in town are actually back towards the front entrance of town, uh, down by this. The, the forester on your right. Oops, let me show chat. The, the forester on your right is a tavern that also has rooms upstairs. And to the left, on the left side of the street, there is a inn called the Last Home. Um, and that one is located right here. Uh, those oh. are the, the two places that one could get a room for the night. Okay, so just those two, gotcha. Mm -hmm. Confluence is a, a smallish town. I think I said 5,400 uh, 5, people, so 5,400 people. And most of them are farmers with just this little, little urban area right here. Uh, are there any taverns as well? I imagine that you know on Friday nights they can't fit 25 yeah. people in the tavern. There are taverns kind of just scattered everywhere. Uh, regular upfront taverns, and then the sort of tavern where it's just like, I have a bar in my basement and I invite 40 people over every day to hang out there. You know, the not quite legal, but not really illegal because there's no problem with it, sort of joints all over the place. All right. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I mean, I, I definitely am putting the taverns into my my scouting out here as much as I can. Mm -hmm. So I guess maybe let's say that all told I hit five different taverns. Sure. Let me make some notes here. Five taverns. Uh, and you can get the lay of the land pretty well with these. What are you trying? What sort of information are you trying to figure out? Mainly, I'm trying to find any way to connect with any thieves guild that might be here. So as, as I said, I'm. I'm listening for anyone to put thieves can't into a conversation. Not necessarily with me, but just if I overhear people at another table, I make sure I place myself to overhear conversations. And I'm also on a professional level, uh, both for appearances and in case it's useful, seeing mm -hmm. if there's, you know, sort of casing each place to see would this be a good place to play as a cover to make some money. Sure. Uh, just north of where you are, a couple of blocks, is a brewery right here on your right. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you're stopping by, because they're giving out free samples of their latest ale that they call the Boar's Head, uh, you you hear a couple of people taste testing the, the latest ale, and you definitely catch one of them use the uh, the thieves can't word for rob or mug um, in in the context of uh, I, I bumped into a guy last night who turned out to be, you know, worth my time, uh, which is you can piece together as I, I robbed a guy or I mugged a guy last night and uh, got away with a lot of money. Okay. I'm, is, is this just somebody drinking in the uh, the brewery? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just two blokes chatting. One of them touting last night's victories. All right. So I will try to, you know, I'm sitting there by myself. Is there any kind of entertainment? Is there any uh, anything else going on in this? Uh, no, it, it, there's maybe 30 people standing around, uh, patrons, maybe five employees or workers here. Um, some of them are cleaning glasses, some of them are passing out glasses. There's one guy on security, uh, sort of a, a heavy set feller, uh, maybe in his late 20s or something, kind of young, but, you know, 6'2", uh, 300 pounds, no armor, but like a really big knotted stick next to him, hanging from his belt by a, a leather thong. Um, kind of just leaning against a wall, looking around, ready to stop anything that might start. All right, I'll go up to the, is there a barkeeper or is he the brewer who, who's, who's- Yeah, the, the, the barkeeper seems to be the guy running the place here. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, male or female? The barkeeper is a female. I uh, say, uh, excuse me, miss. Would you mind if I were to play a set up there for no more pay than what your patrons choose to share with me? 
So but of course. Like uh, we would love you. How about free drinks in exchange? Even better. Yeah, she so, motions to one of her workers to go clear some space for you, and uh, you have a little small stage to play on. All right. So I'm I'm going to do my best here, although my choices of song are going to be some things like The Bandit and the Baroness or other songs that have a bit of roguery to them. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm watching, not obviously, but watching those two that I overheard earlier to try to make sure that I get their interest. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't take long for your songs about roguishness uh, to catch their eye. And they, after making sure that they've sampled every single beer and now are trying to go back and say, no, I didn't sample that one. That was my friend over there. Can I try that one, please? And they're trying to get their second or third round of drinks uh, come over and lean against the bar near to where you are um, holding their conversation, but also giving you some of their attention in a sort of is what's going on over here way. All right. So I'll end my set after an appropriate number of songs and, mm -hmm. and go to sit down next to them at the bar. They come on over. Okay. Uh, oh. Or you go on over to them or whatever. Yeah. Okay. And I'll say... So it's this seems a sleepy enough little town. Uh, you know, they only go, they only get put to sleep when bad musicians come to town and play. But you seem to be lively enough for for all of us here. And tell me, is that song a one of fact or fiction? I think the best are a bit of both. It's all true, especially the lies. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? Uh, what's your name, fella? I'm Leonardo. Nice to meet you. Uh, my name's Raph, and that's my buddy over there, Don. Ah, uh, well, have a seat. We'll leave a uh, another stool here open in case someone else should happen to join us. They, yeah, they kind of look at the scene and go, yeah, I don't know. Mike might be nearby soon. Whatever. Yeah. And so I'll settle in, you know, just sort of ask them about local news, but I'm making sure I'm talking at least as much as I'm asking. Mm -hmm. uh, but in general, I found that if you ask people questions about themselves, they're, or offer them a compliment about something, they'll start spilling all kinds of stuff more than they intended. Yeah, and these guys are not, I mean, they're publicly talking, even if it, in Thieves Camp, but they're still publicly talking about the work they've done last night. It doesn't take much, many prompts to get these guys to start spilling information that they know. I mean, they're, it's kind of early in the morning and there are a few flights in already as well. So, uh... After maybe 10 minutes or so, they start just talking about everything that's going on and how how great life is over here and how in their line of work, you know, there's never been such a good time to be alive. You know, like, things are, are going so well. You just, you couldn't imagine. You couldn't okay. imagine. Have they been obvious about what their line of work is? Or no. Just... Um, okay. Maybe to you, but not to anyone else standing around. All right, well, I'm not giving any indication that, you know, I understand Thieves Cant or anything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'll mention, yeah, it seems, seems really peaceful here. The roads seem pretty safe. You know, coming into town a few days ago, there was this, this woman that, that, I, that was traveling nearby. She just looked to be dressed normally enough, but, you know, we, we shared a campsite just to, you know, more on the road means more safety. And I can tell you, I heard I heard a clink as I was going to sleep. She had this bag perhaps twice as big as your fist. And I saw her carefully counting out in the firelight gold. A bag of gold the size of a fist? Twice the size of a fist. 
Yeah, I, I wouldn't have been traveling with that amount, but apparently it, it must be fairly safe here. Well, it's not that safe. That woman is in a lot of danger. You, think you so? know, you may not have heard, but one of the reasons that it's so good for us is we're, uh, <clears throat> Don and I are, um, I'm sorry, uh, Raph and I are, uh, are mercenaries. You know, we, it's our job to protect the weak and rich. Um, do you think you could maybe introduce us to her? If she, if she's carrying that much money, she needs protection. I don't know. I think I, I, think I last saw her going into the forester, but I don't know if she was getting a room there or if she was just, you know, that's, if she was just stopping for a drink. I mean, that's just down the that block. Was, that was a few days ago. Oh. Uh, well, what'd she look like? Maybe she's still there, you know? Life's, there's never, life is never too good to turn down a job. And Maybe, I don't, I don't know that she's giving a job, uh, any kind of jobs out. I, to be honest, she seemed a little hesitant even to travel with me, very suspicious. I think she preferred well, she, to go about alone. I mean, look at you, you're in your goatee. She was probably afraid that you were a, a mugger or something, you know, you're just, you just reek of I'm an evil monster. Uh, no, no offense or nothing. You're you're a great bard, uh, but you know bards they can't be trusted. They they go from town to town, and it could be anyone, right? Um, That's true. We are inherently shady. And yeah, but the hat you're you're covered in shade the whole time. Uh, so, and you know, you, my mom always told me that life gives you opportunities, and you need to catch them when you can. So this sounds like an opportunity for me, for us, to protect this woman and make some money doing it. Uh, did, what, what did you say she looked like? Maybe we can catch her. Oh, she had uh, short, straight black hair. Uh, I mean, she was about, I don't know, five, three or so, a little bit on the shortest side, uh, about average build. As I said, she had kind of a secretive way about her. Hmm. Hmm. Not not particularly friendly. Like I said, I, I it seemed that only with reluctance did she want to travel with me. I, I don't know that I could tell you much beyond that. Well like I like I said, it seemed like she there was more to her than, than You I know, knew. we probably aren't gonna find her though. If that was a few days ago, she's probably left town. Uh, hey, Raph, you think it's, um, you know, we, we should go talk to your sister because she's got that job for us, you know? So, um, hey, it was really nice to meet you. You say your name was, um, Leonardo, was Le Leonardo right? Yeah, uh, it was uh, re real lovely to meet you. And he reaches out his hand for you. It was my pleasure. Uh, and they quickly, exit the building on the south side and uh, well, vanish from sight going who knows where. Yes, who knows where. Hmm. Don't know what got them leaving in a hurry. Well, they are definitely gone now. Uh, what are you going to do? I am going to go play at the inn across from the forest or what was its name? Uh, the do, 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 the last home. I am going to go to the last home, and I am going to play. Assuming that the, they'll let me. Is there? I don't know if there's anybody else playing there. I don't think there's anybody else playing there. Um, let me just take a look at the layout of the room, and then I can tell you if they have spot for you to play. Uh, let's see. Let's bring you over to this. And take a look at the ground floor over here. Uh, let's zoom out just a touch. So let's see. 
Uh, the ground floor is... Uh, the ground floor does not have... I think that's just an inn here. Uh, I don't think they have any taverns down below. Um, there is a guild hall in the northwest corner. Uh, I guess you could consider it an inn, but it's only for guild members. Uh, but they do have an open hall over here where you could hang out and play. Um, and there are some windows that look towards the forester. All right, I shall go and see if they'll let me play. I mean, this is this is an age without TV or cell phones, so they've got nothing in terms of entertainment except for people like me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, sure enough, they will definitely let you play. The traveling minstrels are few and far between, and uh, you know, the guild hall needs entertainment. How are you supposed to entertain a, or how are you supposed to have a whole bunch of uh, potters? hanging out if they don't have any music to listen to. I mean, you you know those potters. They love their music. If they don't have it, they're just... It's not the same. Uh, so, yeah. They, they give you a little spot. Uh, probably near the front door, because these are fireplaces here and here. I guess you could maybe stand on a table or maybe just walk up and down the hall. There's not... doesn't look like there's much room for a stage. All right, well, I'll... Fireplace sounds good. I'll set myself up by the fireplace over in this corner. It looks like there's some windows. I'm going to play, not looking out the windows, but I am going to play, you know, loudly. I'll sing very boisterously to make sure that anyone in the forester can hear that there's music going on over here. Hmm. Okay. And I guess, given the guild hall, I'll play, uh, start off with the clever merchant and the three foolish nobles. <laughs> that sounds like a song they would love here. Um, yeah, so why don't you give me a performance check, and we'll see how alluring your music is. Oh, that's really good. Uh, yeah. Why is your set so amazingly strong? <laughs> All right, talent. Uh, sure enough, people. I, I engage the audience. You know, I, I um, you know, I do a lot of the, you know, the the really cheesy stuff. You know, I'm singing. You know, like saying about, you know, like when I get to the part about where the the merchant is outsmarting the the first foolish noble. You know, I'm like, you know, get them laughing. Like, oh, this guy, this guy knows, this guy. <laughs> he knows what I'm talking about. You know, all that stupid stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, so you're you're hamming it up. And bit by bit, uh, patrons from the other tavern start coming over here to, to at least take a look. You know, they're not guild members, so they can't really come inside and hang out. But they can stand in the streets and hang out. And so, one by one, they start making their way over here. Um, usually, oftentimes with their ale from the, the forester, and then just kind of standing nearby, um, doing, doing what they can to see what's going on. All right. So I, I work the crowd. Anybody ever, t when I crowd, when I crowd, anybody tell you, ever tell you you're beautiful? No, I must be wrong. And, <laughs> you know, and I'll greet the people outside. Oh, uh -huh. look at this. We got standing room only. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's an attractive little show, and um, a, a small group is gathering over here. That's about when you hear a, a shout and a cry coming from across the street. Uh, you can't make out the words over the music and everyone laughing, but it does kind of pierce the, the audience. Um, and people start looking around, especially the people in the street start looking left and right and then all looking towards the forester. And you can see through the open door some people pointing. All right. If people are pointing, I'll... Oh, God. By Martha's light! And I'll I'll run over to the, the forester. Not like with a weapon drawn or anything, but like a well-intentioned looky-loo. Right. 
Uh, so you make your way down over towards the Forester, and there is uh, that guy named Raff. He is out cold on the ground, like totally out cold. And the other guy nearby, his name was Don. Uh, and Don is leaning against the, the inside wall of the Forester, holding his belly with blood just kind of dripping between his fingers, looking wide-eyed and like leaning back, uh, just kind of staring up. All right, I'll... I'll move in, see this, and as if in horror, kind of back up almost as if absently up against the wall. Mm -hmm. And just as if I'm trying to take all this in and looking amazed and looking very scared. Uh, you, you hear calls for guards and one of the nearby uh, patrons comes over and tries to staunch the bleeding from between Dawn's fingers, but it becomes apparent pretty quickly that this guy doesn't know how to do it and that Dawn's life is uh, fleeting. Um, give me a perception check from your position up against the wall. <laughs> Not very good. Yeah, um, too busy acting. Okay. Uh, so your your back is to the wall, and you can see here that Wilkins is positioned or was positioned right here. Uh, but by the time that you you know, you've made your show that you're just a looky-loo and, and glance around. Uh, Wilkins is no longer there. She has slipped away or disappeared somehow while you were paying attention to the ongoings. All right, did she look injured in any way? No, you caught a, a quick glance at her when you first uh, stepped in, and she was standing there, uh, no weapons in hand, just kind of standing uh, let me show you exactly where she was for a brief moment. Wasn't all the way in the corner. It was, um, she was kind of where that, she was more or less here um, when you first stepped in and then gone when, when you looked back later. All right, she dispatched those two pretty quickly. She might be more than second level. Hmm. Um, so let's do a, a quick check in with you and your plans thus far. Uh, you are a first level rogue. Mm -hmm. You have the stats that are on screen right now. Uh, our current mission is safe, meaning the assassin is to live. Uh, it is chase, meaning the target is... Uh, actually, I think this is simple. Did we change it to simple? I think it is. It's simple and open. I'll correct the overlay in a moment, meaning the target doesn't know that you're coming to kill her and that the manner of her death is not particularly important. She's at least second level and a rogue, but her exact stats, HP and AC and all those things are, are unknown. Um, if you'd like to gauge her stats, you can observe her doing some sort of task for like 10 minutes and then make some checks to figure out what her stats might be or where they might be and help you adjust her HP or her AC. Um, and I'll fill in any relevant information for you as it comes along. Um, what are your... Can you, can you let us in on what you're planning? At all. I didn't expect our, our, um, I don't know if they're teenage or not, but our, our friends to act quite so soon. I was hoping to already have made her acquaintance when they showed up mm. and to make a show of how ineffectual I was compared to her to let down her guard that I had any idea what I was doing or that I was anything but a foppish bard. Mm -hmm. But they uh, apparently had a little more initiative than I thought they would. Yeah. thought they might wait for dark or something. Being a couple flights in around 10 or 11 in the morning, uh, we'll, we'll do that to you. It'll make you rash and act improperly. Uh, did you get any information out of this at all? Do you think anything useful? The fact that she dispatched them that quickly 
took out both of them apparently. So with the one that was out cold, she was he like knocked unconscious or was he stabbed unconscious dying? Uh, no, he was knocked unconscious. You can gather from the audience around that uh, these two gentlemen came up to this this um, lady and started talking to her, and then out of nowhere, she punched one of them. Um, the other one went for a weapon, and she stabbed the guy going for a weapon, uh, while the one that was punched kind of stumbled through the street and just fell on the ground and hit his own head. So... That's the, the scene that played out while well, you were... on the ground and hit his own head. Is yeah. it? Oh, I don't know. Poisoned. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the one she punched hit his own head? Or yeah, like she, she hit a guy and he tripped or something oh, okay. on the threshold and like fell and hit his head on the ground. Oh, okay. I thought maybe the guy who was stabbed fell. No, 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 no. The, the guy who was stabbed just got stabbed and bled to death. All right, so I'm I'm gonna play the you know very curious onlooker, and I'm sure everybody who's here wants to be a star and talk about what they saw. Mm-hmm. And I'm just I'm not gonna specifically ask where she pulled the knife from, mm. but I do give people a lot of lead, you know, and, and you know maybe ask it. Well, she's just like pulled a knife out of nowhere, you know, or give me maybe a, a, give me a persuasion. Is persuasion the right skill here or deception for trying to what skill would you use to try and get people to say something without saying it? That seems like either a persuasion or a deception, but I'm not sure which one. It seems like it might be more deception because I'm not, I'm trying to get information out of them without revealing that I'm I'm not okay. trying to persuade them to tell me something. I'm... I'll take it. Give me yeah. a, a deception check. All right. Which, unfortunately, is too lower than my persuasion. But I appreciate your honesty here. Uh, 13 will definitely do it for us, since we're not rolling with advantage. Uh, these people, people love a gossip, and everyone wants to tell you their story. It seems that she had... Uh, she didn't reach anywhere, you know? It, the dagger was nowhere. And all of a sudden, I mean, she had her arms crossed while they were talking, and then boom, dagger in her hand. Just literally out of nowhere. When I saw her, was she wearing long sleeves? And were they particularly loose sleeves? Uh, They were not long sleeves. They were kind of um, down to the elbow-ish. But she did have one of those shirts that um, is like two fabrics that are crossed over, like almost like a bathrobe, but you know how shirts can cross like that too? Um, so there's the like the inner pocket um, between the two crossed fabrics, like a, a gi or something, or a um, robe. All right. So if she had her arms crossed, maybe she had it somewhere on her upper body in some sort of like maybe sort of like an under the shoulder. Mm-hmm. Or something. Yeah. Okay. Not, so not in a boot. Not no. Hidden yeah. in long... Well, she has short hair, so that... Right. Took out hiding a weapon in her in long hair or in a bun or something. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. So a little bit of information. So I'll just, you know, be one not... I don't draw attention to myself, but I imagine lots of people are asking questions Mm -hmm. i let for the most part i'll let others ask a lot of the questions and i'll you know listen in and and, you know only pop in here and there to ask some innocent things okay you know Uh, just literally be wow shocked and yeah maybe buy some people some drinks to hear the story well, uh, after chatting for a few minutes, the town guard shows up. It is led by the captain of the guard, a gentleman named Bronson, who wears a, a red shirt with gold and green trim, brown pants, and high boots. He's got a, a cudgel at his side and speaks with a booming voice. Um, one of it, He's got his two guards with him. Uh, and Bronson comes in and talking real, you know, kind of taking up the presence of the room with his <clears throat> authoritative voice. All right, everybody, tell me what happened. Who, who the hell are these people? That guy's waking up. Someone arrest him quickly. 
who, who's this guy? How did he get stabbed? And starts asking questions. Uh, and everyone pitches in to tell him their version of events, which seems like the two gentlemen came on in. They seemed friendly, if a little maybe intoxicated, and uh, started talking to the girl, the woman. Um, yeah, thirties woman. Uh, one of the, the people that one of the the serving ladies here said that she was bringing drinks over to them when, and she could hear a tone in the lady's voice that uh, she was not happy with these two people who seemed to be pestering her. Um, and then another person nearby, or who claims to have been nearby, says that the these guys kept asking or kept telling her that they she needed protection, and that they had the best rates in town. It's just you know a gold a day per uh, mercenary to defend her and her property from anything. And she kept saying, "It's fine. I don't need you to guard me. I'm okay." And they they pushed the matter, um, and then you know. Before you knew it, one guy's on the ground and the other guy's bleeding and he had a weapon in his hand and she, no one knows whether it was self-defense or assault or murder or, or what it was. Um, yeah, that's kind of the scene that's playing out. All right. And so, and so that we don't go, hey, Rob never mentions the cat except in very rare circumstances when it's useful. <laughs> I, you know, I am petting the cat, you know, uh, you know, playing with Sophie absently as I, I listen to people here. I, I take one of the ribbons from my loot, you know, I dangle it and she goes for it, things like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because nothing disarms people's suspicions like, you know, being nice to a cute little animal. Everyone loves animals. And if you love animals, then you must be a good person. Um, eventually, the sheriff gets around to you and says, You there, musician, were you playing here at the time of the incident? I I, I wasn't Officer Bronson, but uh, apparently these, these people had a death wish or something dealing with her. Do you know the woman in question? No, but she, they... And, and I'll, I'll you know, point to one of the people who was sharing the story. Like, that, and over there, he he saw the whole thing, and he told me how she just dispatched both of them, you know, with, within as fast as he could blink. Hmm. Well, these two are notorious about town. I've seen seen them both in jail twice this year so far. So. I'm inclined to believe this one was a matter of self-defense, and these poor fools just bit off more than they could chew. Thieves, usually. <sighs> she Bronson looks to the guards and kind of gives them a take the bodies away motion uh, and goes over to the bartender to apologize for the mess and uh, looks around one last time for any last bit of information that he might need. Hmm... I'm satisfied. And uh, begins to leave while his men drag the bodies down the street. So, wow, with, with with Officer Bronson on on duty, I'm I'm sure that he'll be more than enough to deal with the evil that men do. Oh yes, yes, definitely, Officer Bro Sheriff Bronson's a good one. You know, he he's a real good one. Sounds like he's putting on a real crackdown. Well, um, you know, it, I guess I just, I have such faith in him. When he speaks, I, I just feel protected by him. You know, he's got that, that voice that just wraps you in warmth and tells you everything's going to be okay. You know, if we had crime statistics, I would love to look at them, but those haven't been invented yet. So I just feel much safer when he's around. Yeah, he's he's definitely the kind of kind of uh, officer you'd want on duty when there's someone behind the door. Yeah, I'm just not getting it. No, it's I don't get it either. Oh, okay, cool. Definitely, definitely. Um, and I guess the the crowd begins to slowly disperse. 
I, I, I guess none of these other people have seen Charles Bronson movies. Um, haven't. I assume that was why you named this guy Bronson. <laughs> I just needed a name, and I'm bad at naming things. <laughs> but why don't we go to our first break, because it's been just about an hour. Uh, we have two more hours of this coming up. Uh, we are, let's see, done with the orientation phase. We are in phase two of the game, which is the assess, opponent, uh, assess your target phase. Then we'll eventually get to phase three, which is the setup. Phase four, which is the execution, and the all-important phase five, escaping without being caught. Uh, and that's what we have to look forward to in our next two hours. So we will see you in a little bit. Bye.
Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Assassin. Uh, Rob, Assassin. It yes. looks like the Forester has cleared out. Uh, where are you going and what are you up to? Yes, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> or perhaps it is time that I reveal <gasps> that I am not Rob, <gasps> but silent. Oh, oh. Yeah, I guess I am Rob, sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought it was going to be a really big reveal. I'm sorry, Neil. Just rip off the mask and it's Steven underneath with all the hair. No, not today. Not today. All right, well, clearly I need to take care of important things here then. So as things are calming down, I've got all the information that I need. Uh, what time of day is it? It is, let's see, it's probably been about a few hours since we started, so it's around noon or just after. I, I am going to then uh, take care of something very, very necessary. There's a stream outside. I'm going to go out and walk to the stream. Mm -hmm. Do I see any kids fishing? Yes, you do. There are children fishing at the stream. Excellent. I'm going to go up to the children. Okay. And I'll have uh, Sophie walking around on my shoulders, you know, reaching up and petting Sophie. Mm -hmm. say, How's the fishing today? Fine. They're not biting, though. She oh, is biting. biting. No, he's biting. It's uh, one, a little girl and a little boy. They both have rods. So she's biting. I no, he's biting. Oh. -uh. You bit me first. Well, you bit me harder. Well, that's too bad. There's no, no biting. Not even a little one? Uh, they pull up a, a small, little, tiny fish. This one. Wiggle, wiggle. All right, so you know what? That looks perfect for Sophie. So what do you what do you think, Sophie? Could I could I buy that fish from you? For a copper? They nod eagerly and take the fish off the hook uh, and thrust it into your hands. All right. And is it still wriggling and alive, you say? Uh it's it's barely alive. You know, it's just got a few twitches left in it. It's probably been caught a few minutes ago. Slowly dying. All right, I'll start walking back across the bridge there. And as I get to the bridge, I assume there's some sort of railing. Mm -hmm. and I'll take the fish and I'll like thwap. Toss thwap it into the head. water? No, I thwap the fish's head against the railing. Oh, thwap. okay. Or hopefully you... kill it, or maybe just to knock it unconscious to be devoured alive by some. You bash the fish's brains in, putting it to a, a quick and swift death. All right, and I will head over to, what was the name of the one across from the? The Last Home. The Last Home. I will go over to The Last Home, and I will, they don't have any place to eat there though, huh? Um, the downstairs did not have a tavern built into it, but I think they will take orders. Let me take a look at the, the layout again. They're really overlooking a revenue stream here, Neil. This is a clear and obvious revenue stream, which they are not tapping into. Well, you know, I, I don't think they're going to be moving into, uh, you know, the business models of the 13th century here. You know, not everyone can be as uh, shrewd a businessman as you are. There is a, a small kitchen there that they will make meals for the people staying. They'll, they'll make breakfast for people staying there. Um, but that's that's about it. Do they have a they, sitting room downstairs or anything at all? No, their downstairs is actually a warehouse that they uh, use space for, and then they rent the upstairs rooms as in rooms. So they're not a full in. They're like a, a warehouse slash in combo. Yeah, that's definitely synergistic. You know, that no one here has an MBA. They haven't been invented yet. How are they supposed to know how to do these things? 
well, I guess my business model is going to be to invent an NBA and then start uh, educating people in them. Supply and demand. I'll have the. I'll have a monopoly. <laughs> we'll save that for another campaign. We'll have the. Um, I don't know. We'll come up with a good name for it. That's why I was taking planning to take level in accountancy, but. Anyway, I guess after I go in there and get frustrated because there's nowhere to sit and eat or anything, I guess I'll go over to the Forester, which seems to be my only actual option as far as a place to stay. Uh, yeah, you can head back over to the Forester and just move right there. And uh, things have settled down here. Uh, people have chilled out and are getting back to their whatever they were doing beforehand um all right so i think it's time for leonardo to have lunch and he'll also ask for a a dish for sophie of course they're more than happy to bring sophie a, a glass of milk or uh whatever it is that you you would like oh and... i just needed a dish so she could eat her fish Oh, right. They'll, they'll bring a small dish for her to eat her fish. All right. So I'll, I won't put it on the floor. I'll, I'll serve her at the table with me and I'll, I'll make a conversation with her as we. we you'll talk to the cat? Yes. Okay. And I'll, I'll talk to the cat, but then also assume responses from her and carry on with the whole conversation. Can we get a, um, a sample of this dialogue? Uh, sure. Um, so, so you know, this this pork could be a little bit better. How's that fish there, Sophie? Wow. Off the scale, you say? Well. Wow. Well, wow. I guess. Uh, Interesting, interesting. I had not considered it from that angle, but you, you've always got the, uh, the clever take on these things. All right. Uh, where where are you you sitting uh, or hanging out or standing or whatever? Well, let's see. It seems like these tables are pretty full. So I'm just going to eat at this bar stool right here. Okay. And... So between my meal and um, let's splurge and get something a little, say a mid-level uh, quality of drink. Sure. How much do I toss down here for that? Like uh, five copper? Five copper will do it. All right. And after I've had my meal or as I'm wrapping up, I'll start to make conversation with the, the bartender and start to see whether he might like someone to play here. Yeah, we'd love to have someone play here. Did you, um, I thought I saw you standing about earlier today. Do you think you could put together a song about the the happening at the Forester? I, thought, I think that'd be a really great title for the song. The happening at the Forester. Right? Doesn't it have a ring to it? The happening at the forest. Wow. Right? Definitely. As I'll I'll have to see what I can do here. Well I mean a, a title like that deserves a song to match. Thank you. I, I I I knew you were a good bard when I saw you. Yeah. Alright. So I'm going to take the tune of the goblins and the midwife and I'm going to uh, use that to, I'll just start changing the words and make up a chorus to, uh, to replace the chorus about when the goblins switch the child out. Mm -hmm. And it'll be about, um, instead of the goofy antics of the goblins, it'll be the the goofy antics of these uh, 
uh, these thieves, and mm. instead of the the stern midwife, um, I don't, you know, I don't know the name, so I'll just, you know, supposedly, so I'll just make up a name for the um, the woman who put them to. Okay. Right. And in my story, she'll she'll beat them senseless with a rolling pin. Okay. Okay. Um, and the, and the bartender, whose name I will get, will factor in as noticing that they were trying to pick her pockets and giving her a warning. And you know, he's he's something of a hero in this thing too. His name is Clyde. All right. Uh, so Clyde could have a name to go easier with some sort of nickname for him. To, uh, whatever he is. Clyde the Snide? Yeah, see, see? Doesn't quite do it. Uh, uh, you know, it could be Nero the Hero or something. But anyway. Uh, yeah, so... Make sure that Cl that Clyde is something of a hero here. Okay. You know he gives her a warning. He see he knows that these these people are up to no good. It's his his war his warning that saves her at the last minute. Mm hmm. And so I I tell the story here. Okay. Uh, you want to give me another performance check and see how well your on the spot story goes, on the spot song. <laughs> it's um I keep trying to find something to rhyme with Clyde. Yeah, I think you're people maybe think you're you're putting on a performance and then you're stumbling and uh, you, uh Sophie keeps like batting at your strings on your loot, like hitting them with her claws. And uh, I think what started off as a performance quickly becomes like a, no, hold on, tune, tune, what's that word? And becomes more of like a side practice thing. Um, it, uh, it doesn't go too well. Yeah, the audience is like, rolling pin, that's playing into outdated stereotypes. Mm -hmm. And uh, exactly. Yes. So I acknowledge and try to be better. Uh, well, that didn't go well. I was hoping to maybe get a night stay here out of that, so I guess I'll have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. How much? How much do I have to pay for a night here? Twenty copper. It's a, a cheap place. I mean, if you want a, a kind of a bulk room, you know, like a place with a room with three or four beds and any other number of people could be sleeping in it, you can go away with a twenty. If you want your own private room, it's going to be close to like eighty copper. Yeah. Um, so I'll have spent close to a gold at this point. If I go. I'm, I'm going to get my own private room. Okay. Sophie deserves the best. I'll even say that to uh, the innkeepers. Like, you know, if it was just me, I'd sleep the common room. But the Queen Sophie here has standards. Of course. Of course. And I haven't seen Sarah return here, have I? You have not. Um, and granted, it's only been a few hours since the altercations. Um, I'm guessing uh, this might have gone very badly. She might have flown the coop. What are her options? Where can she go? Well, she's going to wait around for her handler. She's not going to disappear entirely, which means I can find her. So I'm going to get a good night's sleep, and we'll try again in the morning. All right. Uh, we can just skip to the next day. So I'm going to start out by again getting about town um, to see what I can see, starting with going to the market looking for any fine produce uh, i guess probably in that middle market square i'm checking out the different 
produce and also anyone else who happens to be doing so. Okay. Maybe I find uh, myself a, a good apple, purchase that. Sure. And eat it as I walk around the rest of the market looking at other things here. Sure, sure. Um, this is the, the second day? Yes. Morning uh, of the second day. All right. Uh, and you stayed at the Forester that night. So give me a perception check, would you please? Of course. die or not with me today. Uh, they're just warming up, right? First rules of the game are always a little wonky. Uh, but 11 is all that you need, actually 10 is all that you needed to spy Sarah Wilkins. Uh, as you're in the apple, uh, in the market buying an apple, you see her coming from the north end of the market uh, through it and kind of down southward in the direction of the forester. All right. Uh, well, that's good to know. Mm -hmm. I will spend a bit of the morning, um, this seems like an obvious place where I would perform, and I will perform. Sure. Uh, you perform in the market square for a while, you make a few copper coins, not too many, you can add 10 to your, your currency, your money. Um, and she doesn't seem to come back this way. Uh, why don't you give me a perception check from where you're standing in the market to see if you can tell which building she goes into DC 15 on this one. Uh, that'll do. Yeah, you can see her. You can keep an eye on her as she heads down that uh, street and she takes a, a left-hand turn into the Forester. All right. Yeah, I figured if that's where she's supposed to meet her person, she's going to end up there. She... <coughs> All right, I will continue my performance until mm -hmm. lunchtime. Sure. And return to the Forester. Well, actually, return to the stream first. Kids out there again? Kids are still there. Um, this time, it's a group of four. And they do not see you coming. All right, I... Well, I announced myself. So if it's, uh, are they the same kids or different ones? Two of the same and two additional children. All right, um, so I'll go to the two kids that I've met before. I said, I hope the only thing's biting in the fish. Yep, we got a bigger one today, and they pull up a, a slightly bigger fish, maybe about yay big. Oh, that is a really big one. You know, I I wonder if that's too big for Sophie. What do you think, Sophie? I reach up and pet Sophie. You no, know, I look down the one. What do, what do you what do you think? Do you have do you have a smaller one? Uh, uh, they look around and they shake their heads. No, just this one. Well, I guess it'll have to be that one. That one, I'd say that's twice as big as the one yesterday, wouldn't you say? Mm-hmm. That means twice as many copper. Absolutely. That's you know you're a hard bargainer, but you got me. Mm-hmm. So I'll pay two copper. And All I'll right. take the fish. And I will go back to the forester, ask for a dish for Sophie, and feed Sophie at the table with me while I sit and have a meal. Sure. Uh, as you are sitting and having a meal, you see Sarah Wilkins sitting on a bench um, against the wall, and you can see that she's like leaning her head against the wall and looking sideways out the window, which kind of looks, uh, from her angle, she'd be looking down the road towards the bridge entrance to town. Um, and she's just got a, a pint that is still mostly full. Um, and she's just kind of leaning against the wall, looking out the window and then around, around the bar and out the window. All right. Um, are there, it looks like there's a good number of people in here. How many would you say? Uh, I would say right now there's maybe 10 people. Four, right. 14 people, 14. 
Okay, so are we even male female split? Uh, I think we're pretty close to that. I don't know if it's exactly 50 50. I can count though, since I actually have their tokens. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight females. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven males, eight males with you. Um, All right. I am going to pick uh, the most attractive looking female in here and try to do a little bit of flirting, try to catch her attention. I do have a cat that I'm treating very well sitting here with me, which is probably a certain draw. I think that's a pretty good icebreaker, I would expect. I introduce uh, Queen Sophie. Um, you know, I do a lot of, you know, sort of the, the little joke I was doing about Sophie having higher standards than, than I do. Right. She existed on this place, and et cetera, et cetera. So I'm just uh, doing some light flirting here. Sure. Just give me a a charisma check. Just a flat charisma check for persuasion. Kind of, um I was just gonna just sure, sure. I guess flirting could be under the guise of persuasion. It's a it's a charm charming way of chatting. Sure. Alright. Uh so yeah, your charming factor right now is about twenty three, which is pretty good. All right, and I only if I can do so unobtrusively, I'm not going to go out of my way to do this, but I will see if at some point I can take a glance and see if Sarah is noticing me or not. Yes, you absolutely can take a look and spot Sarah. Uh, this is the question where, this is the time where I want to ask you what it is that you're wearing um, especially anything regarding weapons or armor that might be visible. Um, so we can judge what uh, your visibility is. So I am going to, um, the only thing I want to have on me mm -hmm. is a knife and not like a full on dagger, but just like a knife that I would use to cut my food. Sure. Just something, just something a typical peasant might have on them. I'm okay. wearing, um, my performer's coat you know, with different colored patches. I have my loot mm -hmm. and I have uh, the various ribbons and strips of cloth tied to it and mm -hmm. the loot strap. And I'm gonna have um, a wide brimmed hat, not not my wide brimmed black assassin's hat, but mm. a, a performer's hat, kind okay. of a showy one with a big um, uh, colorful plume. Sure. Do you have any hidden weapons on you that uh, another assassin might be able to suss out? The like, only one is the, um, just the... the sword in the loot. Oh, there's a sword in the loot. Okay. Yes. I will give her a check to see if she's noticed that. Okay. And then... All right. So she's not really paying too much attention to you. Um, you, you give her a glance every now and then, and she seems pretty content um, with the situation as is, and is still mostly looking out the window. All right. So after a bit of flirting here and trying to seem innocuous, I am going to uh, ask if I can play. Clyde looks at you and goes, I don't know, can you? Uh, you know, I... I admit I it wasn't I didn't do the best job coming up with something on the spot. I'm better with the classics. All right. You like Freebird? Uh Freebird? can you do me a Wonderwall? Who doesn't like Freebird? Okay. All right. Okay. I either one. All right, so I'll try to do better here. Let's There you go. It's it is an average performance. Oh. Comically average. Uh, so you can get up Here, and you can... Here's the thing with this newfangled online stuff. Back in my day, we knew that dice needed to be motivated. So it became tradition that if you, we were going to roll a d20, we would roll two d20s. One would be stated as the official d20. The mm -hmm. other one would be the competition die. Oh. Because we felt it would motivate the official die to have another die rolling 
and it would want to do better than the first die. And I do want to specify that we did this in a group I was playing with that was mostly astrophysicists <laughs> who apparently were absolutely fine with humanizing the dice and attributing emotions to them well, and a I fair amount of superstition. But I think we all know that if your dice don't perform well, you separate them from the rest of the herd and you put them in a spot that's either like a dark enclosed area where they can feel their shame or, you know, like in like a, a spot uh, high up somewhere where they're in like public display of their shame. And after they've appropriately been timed out, you bring them back and let them play with the other dice again. And if they keep pissing you off, you there are other things we do to them. See, I, I guess that is one area where I have gone a bit more modern in shaming my die. When my die fail me, I like to put a picture on Facebook with a little sign in front of the die that say, I failed a death saving throw for my owner causing a total party kill. Yeah. You know, I just post that on Facebook for everybody to see mm. the die shame. You know, I don't like that sort of public shaming. I feel that's um, cruel and maybe a little abusive. I, I, the, the localized public shaming among your own group is a good motivator, I find. But that sort of stuff, I I don't know if I can condone such a, a public humiliation. But to each their own. I, yeah, I mean, I guess if you're some sort of snowflake who doesn't want to give your die the discipline that, you know... I, they really just need we a motivational back, speech. We had back in the day when we had these crummy die that came in the basic set where you had a crayon because they didn't even color in the, uh, the numbers. You had to do that yourself. And I'm sure in this day where you just have, you don't even have to like have the pre-painted die. You've got die apps on your phone with yeah. your poke of books and and instant 20s or whatever mm -hmm. and all that stuff but you know hey you these, gotta get with the times it's the die you, that built the nation you gotta modernize a, a different time called for a different die but we've moved on as society and we you know you know we, we should just agree to disagree all right let's all I'm saying is back in my day, these were the kind of die that had radio preachers screaming about how demonic Dungeons and Dragons were. And now you got them on Big Bang Theory. I mean, come on. Just saying nobody's respecting the D and D the way we they panicking about it the way they did back in my day. We appreciate the work that you did getting us to where we are today, but we, we need to move past those old hurdles, past those old uh, misconceptions about things. That includes updating our perspective on dice. All right. All right. Let's... I don't know. Just, just saying, if you don't have some sort of major evangelical ministry coming after you, then you're doing something wrong with your D&D &D game. That's all. <laughs> Now let's get back to this heartless assassination scenario. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Your target is in sight. She's right there. She's 15 feet from you or so, maybe 20 feet. Um, but you are busily engrossed uh, talking with one of the other people here and showing oh, off your now. cat. Oh, and you're playing your loot. That's right. You're playing the loot. Yeah. And again, I make a show of engaging, you know, each individual person, you know, sort of singing at various times, singing to particular people, singing mm -hmm. them out to make them feel part of the performance. And in the process of that, I do, you know, just as I would anybody here, uh, sort of direct my singing at her and give her a smile. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, she'll... React. Yeah, she'll look at you while you're singing and kind of give a, a a polite, if somewhat tired, smile and a, like a nod, like yes, yes, hurry it up, okay. I don't, um, and sort of tries to avoid eye contact with you. 
Um, she seems oh. sort of uh, distant and like like she's trying to keep to herself and not engage with you, even though you're like clearly going around the tavern and talking to everyone. She's like. Thank All right, you, I'm going to try to give off um, the feeling of, of, you know, the impression of looking a little, oh, she's playing hard to get, is she sort of intriguing thing? Yeah. Um... <laughs> if I'm taking that as a challenge. Okay. Just kind of like, ah, I see when she. She's shifts entirely so now you're just like facing her peripheral and just like does a complete I'm not looking at you I'm just looking out the window I am ignoring the bard now I want nothing to do with him okay so I'll play my set for a while I won't I won't bug her again mm -hmm. I'll play up to other people that are being more responsive mm -hmm. and when I finish um, when I was over there, did I see what she was drinking? Uh, yeah, it looked like the the cheapest ale in the room, uh, but it also looked like she has been working on it very slowly. You know, like, she's got a glass of ale so that she can sit here, but she's not, you know, it'll probably take her an hour or two to finish it. Maybe more. All right. I'll get two glasses of the third best ale. <laughs> <laughs> so this, like, I'm crying, but I'm not rich. Okay. So, oh yeah, this is German, and uh, yeah, yes, that's better. Yes. Okay. And I'll um, bring a mug over and sit with her. She looks at you and goes, "You're not going to give me trouble." Like those guys yesterday, are you? I'll look a little... I'll just like... Was that you? Look, I... You're a fine bard. But I am... Not here to socialize. Oh, wow. Well. You're in an inn, you're surely here to drink. Perhaps we can do that together at least. But I'll push one of the ales over to her. She slides it right back in your direction. No, thank you. I, uh, I need time to sit and think. If you don't mind, I would like to sit and think alone. Okay, I'll look concerned now. Are you okay? Is everything all right? Hmm. <clears throat> Yes. Can I um, do my best to be charming and try to use persuade to at least get her to engage with me a little bit? Sure. Uh, give me a persuasion check to see if you can't suss out some amount of conversation from her. Although she's pretty icy, so it's going to be a pretty high check. Wow. Well, uh, you are, you are uh, nothing if not able to work your words, uh, work a little magic with your words, and Eventually, after a few more attempts, she goes, all right, uh, one drink, but really, I I could use some time alone. Um, and she takes her the drink that you brought to her and uh, takes a, a large swig of it and says, uh, what? Hi, what's your name? I'm Leonardo. Lovely no, to meet I'll, you. I'm, I'm Sarah. Whisper. Are you in trouble, Sarah? Was are there? Are they gonna? Are they gonna try to? Are they gonna try to come after you? Don't worry about it. I'm fine. I can take care of myself. I'll. I'll say a little bit nervously. Well, I, I, I could, I could guard you. If you oh think my God! That's exactly what they said yesterday, and one of them ended up dead. Oh no! I didn't mean like. Hey, I just, I just. You know, meant I. Oh, I'm oh, okay. I'll, uh, I'll she around. leans in okay. and grabs your shirt by your your lapels and pulls you in close to her and says, "Listen, I can take care of myself. I don't need you to watch me or guard me. And if you are going to insist on causing trouble," and she kind of pushes away, you might end up like one of those guys. All right, I. 
I look a bit scared at that, a little, a little taken aback. Okay. And I get back looking a bit abashed. And I'll sit there quietly for a bit and I said, well, I, I saw them afterwards. I, I guess you really can take care of yourself, can't you? She nods just once to herself. I say, are you, are you like a, a mercenary or something? Like an adventurer? She shakes her head a little bit. <clears throat> no. Uh, fisherman. Oh, okay. And I'll, um, this seems like a great time to bring in Sophie. I'll call Sophie over. Mm -hmm. I, I think you might, you might end up with a fan here then. I've been, I've, I've been paying the local kids to, uh, to get fish for her. Maybe I can strike up a deal with you, I say. Try to be charming. Oh, well, I wouldn't want to take away money from the kids. That seems like a, a good thing going on. Okay, that's yeah, true enough, true enough, and I'll... The world's so full of dark things these days. You know, it needs a little bit of hope. Okay, and I've got Sophie up on the table, and I'm petting, stroking Sophie. Mm -hmm. And at one point I'll stop so that she feels that she wants to start petting Sophie. Uh, like, yeah, I mean, if yeah. when Sophie kind of walks around, she'll scritch her and scratch her a little bit. Um, but she keeps kind of looking down the, the road as if she's expecting something, and then looks back to you and says, uh, you said your name was Leonardo. What do you do? Aside from annoy people who are trying to spend time alone. Well, that's my main profession, but as a side gig, I try to be a bard. <laughs> Of course, of course. It's not going as well as the annoying, though. Clearly, uh, seem to be faulty at both. I, I smile a little bit at that. Then, um, I say, you said the world is dark and dangerous. Is something happened to your family, or you ask a lot of very personal questions? Well, I just, okay, I'll be honest. You were the one person here who who didn't really interact with me or seemed to respond to the music. And A glutton for punishment, I see. Yes. I know the type. Always looking for the one thing you can't have and always setting yourself up for failure so you'll never get it. Yeah. I say perhaps. Yeah. I know what that's like. But as Matrigal, the goddess of hope, says, there's... You can always move forward. You can always make amends. It's true. Or you like to think it's true. As long as there's life, there's hope. Hope is always the last thing to die. Everything else is lost. Hope fights on. That's why uh, Matrigal is the brightest star in the sky. I'll look a little quiet for a bit. I'm thinking and then take a, a swig. I know a little bit about hope. See, that's... That's what kept me going in the mines when I was a kid kid in the mines yeah it was a, a silver mine they uh they didn't give us a choice about becoming miners minor miners hmm where where are you from uh i don't remember the name of the village you gave me <laughs> you could give a region i don't remember the name of the village either From a little village called Brugla in uh, <laughs> it's out, you probably don't know it. It's it's on the Isle of. Oh, Gade Isle. Yeah, 
Yeah. Tough area up there. I had a, a friend eaten on Gator Beach once. Eaten? Eaten, yep. By gators. Uh, usually we tried to stay away from them, but... Wow. That's... At least I got out of the mine, I said. Mm-hmm. She nods. That was... It was tough to have hope that it was... They sent us in before sunrise and let us out until after sunset. I'd say there was a couple of years when the full moon was the most light I saw. How'd you get out? There was a, a group of gypsies that came through and hmm. they were they were playing, they were performing, putting on late night shows as they do out at the edge of town. It seems like they weren't maybe treated a little better than us, but not by a lot. I managed to sneak out and, and see them and I was I was fascinated. Your music. I hadn't heard it in years. It just just pulled me in. I felt like I was floating around on it. I, I knew if I tried to get away, they would hobble me or worse, but it seemed worth it at that point. And, when and here you are, some point, years later? I went with them, even even as badly treated as they were. It was better than I was used to. It was, I learned to play. There was freedom wandering the world, not tied down anywhere. Seeing what's around the next bend. When you get tired of where you are, moving on to see what else is out there, you know? Well, if only all of us could live so freely. Many of us are tied down by lives that we can't change. You know, I think if you, if you think you can't change your life, there's things you're missing. Hmm. I mean, if I could get out of the mines and now I move out with complete freedom, it's just a matter of what you're willing to give up. Or what you're willing to do. There are some lines that maybe we shouldn't be crossing. Uh, and look at that, I finished my drink. Well, Leonardo, it was surprisingly not uncomfortable talking to you. Um, but I must get back to my sitting alone. All right, then. Uh, if surprisingly not uncomfortable is the most interesting compliment I've had today, I maybe I'll see you around. Uh, are you try staying in town long? I don't know. Well, depends on how interesting the town is and what's around the next bend. There's a river, the stream that goes down here. I know. I'm a fisherman. Fish you know the river every goes. Thursday. You know where it goes? What's up and down? Eventually, it leads out into the canals near High Castle. Uh, and it is a confluence just south of town. One river leads... Um, let's see, the Honey Rapids leads up kind of in the middle of nowhere, while the Dwarfgate River heads up towards Tharnam. What's Tharnam like? Small dwarven town. Uh, lots of mining, coal and silver, copper, some dyes, bunch of dwarves, nasty folk. Seems like the kind of place we could live it up. We? we? Head out. It's 
time that you get back to not annoying other people. <laughs> All right, I'll let you get back to your fish. She nods and uh, can returns her gaze to out the window. All right. I'll go talk with others, uh, do some drinking, and towards the evening, uh, do another set. Yeah, she's been there the whole day. Um, she didn't leave, not once. She kind of sat in that spot, sipped a drink. I guess she must have left to go use an outhouse somewhere at some point in time, but, you know. All right, and I'll do play whatever the equivalent of Freebird is and kind of direct that at her here and there. Sure, <laughs> Stop sure. Stop being as free as a bird. And... Yeah. Uh, she'll give you a glance every now and then with like an eye roll involved in it and then keep her eyes out, focused out the window. All right. Uh, uh, okay, well, we're yeah. just... Oh, okay, I was going to take a break, but do you have something else before... Uh, another average performance. You know, you're... I don't know if these average performances are a blessing or a curse because they're not attracting any attention. It's not going to be a memorable performance. No one's going to know that you are here. <laughs> that was the perfect spy performance. <laughs> Just middle of the road. Yes. Okay. All well, right. Let's take our break. And when we come back, uh, you're going to have to find a way to, to end it, to end her life. So we'll see you guys in a moment on the other side of our break.